Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Nall, a brand new study out of Japan from the Tohoku University School of Medicine shows that just 30 to 60 minutes of weekly muscle strengthening activity is linked to a 10 to 20% lower death risk. Now, we know what exercise does when you do it daily. I don't recommend 30 to 60 minutes. I recommend 30 minutes a day, not per week. Because when you do it more often than just, let's say, two or three times a week, you're starting your day with endorphins, the feel-good hormones secreted by the brain when you're exercising. It's called the runner's high. And ask anyone who's been a long-distance runner, how does it feel when you're out there training? Well, after about an hour, you feel just blissful. You're in the zone. And that carries forward for hours upon hours. In fact, I did some studies in the 1970s at the Institute of Applied Biology, working with a lot of runners. And we found that if you run twice a day for 45 minutes, you can keep those endorphins, those feel-good hormones, elevated for about 12 hours or half your day. And that's important. Start the day on an upscale mood, but also you're burning fat, especially your body mass index around your belly and abdomen. That fat is going down because the fat on your belly does not belong to the belly. It belongs to your overall metabolism. You could do a thousand sit-ups a day. It's not gonna take any fat off your belly. It'll strengthen the muscles, which is good. Even 20 sit-ups a day is good, but it's the overall reduction of calories and therefore your modified fasting, meaning between your last meal at night, let's just say for argument's sake, you finish at seven o'clock and your next meal in the morning, and let's say for argument's sake, it's at, oh, uh, it's at seven o'clock, you eat breakfast. You've had 12 hours between seven and seven to fast. That will help you. You're gonna live a longer life and also, you're going to be burning fat. It'll shift your metabolism. And that's what we want. But exercising, oh, it's terrific. So just please get out there and do your exercises to the best you can, um, as often as you can as well. Now, another study, and this one is, uh, this is from Barcelona Institute for Global Health, says that lower oxidative stress in children who live and study near green spaces. Now, Oxidative stress is a normal part of living. Am I just sitting here breathing in oxygen, exhaling carbon dioxide? That creates oxidative stress. That's normal. Now, smoking, drinking, eating barbecued food, eating refined carbohydrates, French fries and, and white bread and pastas, that really increases your oxidative stress. Trauma, viruses, bacteria, parasites also create oxidative stress having the wrong bacteria in your body, that also creates oxidative stress. And of course, disease is oxidative stress 24 seven, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. So anything that can lower our oxidative stress is gonna be good for us. And here they're finding at the Barcelona Institute for Good Health, they've analyzed for the first time the relationship between exposure to different green spaces, woods and parks, and oxidative stress in children. And the study concluded that greater exposure to vegetation is associated with a lower level of oxidative stress. And this is associated with observed, um, let's say regardless of a child's physical activity. So it doesn't matter what a child's doing, playing, uh, studying, reading, but get them into nature. If you live where there's no major green space, then look for the parks. In, you know, in New York, in all of our boroughs, we have a lot of parks. Get your kids into the park. University of Granada, which is in Spain, depression is more than a mental disorder. It affects the whole body. That's an international team of researchers has scientifically proven for the first time that depression is more than a mental disorder. It causes important alterations of oxidative stress so it should be considered a systemic disease since it affects the whole organism. And the results of this work were published in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry. And it explains the significant association that depression has with cardiovascular disease and cancer. 
and why people suffering from depression die younger. But I would look at it differently. <clears throat> I had two advantages in my insights. Both came from remarkable human beings. One of those human beings was the father of all of our knowledge of distress and what it does to the body, Dr. Han Selye. I met with him. I spoke with him. He was on my radio show, for those of you who go back to WMCA and before, uh, on numerous occasions. Now, how he said it, and this is kind of an oversimplification, is that when you're stressed in a good way, where you're excited and happy about something, a marriage, a new relationship, uh, a new job, uh, moving into a new, better location, going to a concert, that's a good stress. Going out with friends for the evening, that's a good stress. It's mild, but it's good because you're getting the good hormones balance. But a negative stress is what he called de-stress. Distress. And distress is when you're, you're fearful, you're filled with angst, um, you're apprehensive. That's a bad stress because that elevates our stress hormones, mainly cortisol, but other ones as well. And that now over at least the last 50 years has been associated with multiple problems, including heart disease and, and cancer. So what we want to do is we want to lower overall our element of stress that can re create depression. Now, one of the many causes, I'm, not, I'm talking about many, many causes of depression. I've done several documentaries on depression. A lot of the people I've counseled over the years have had depression. And each one was from a different reason. So there's not one size fits all. You have to take it individually. And uh, for example, I'll give you one example. Uh, I was counseling a woman who had been under treatment for breast cancer but it wasn't working and she was deeply depressed. So when we spoke, she talked about her fears and she said, 24 seven, I'm thinking about my life's going to end soon. I don't know when, but it's going to end. And all the things that I enjoy or appreciate are gonna be gone. There'll be an end to this. And she said, and then I visualize the ending and it saddens me and it scares me. And, uh, this woman was only 42 years old and she had tried all the different cancer therapies and it didn't help. And now she was suffering side effects of the chemotherapy and radiation, which by the way is secondary cancers. So when we start to talk about what in your life do you feel might have contributed to your mental state that precipitated the cancer? And first she says, well, that has nothing to do with cancer. I said, let's just play along with this to see if there's something we might find opening doors. And literally, that's what people have to do. You have to open doors that have been closed and not be afraid of what comes out. Even if what comes out might change your perception of yourself or others' perception of you. In any case, after about an hour of conversation, something clicked. And she said, I don't know if this is a part of it, but for the last 20 years of my marriage, all I do is everyone's work. I'm responsible for everything. You know, she said, what do you think it's like? And then she gave me this as an example. She said, when I, I have to go finish my work, I go to the store, I buy the food, I come home, I prepare the food, I serve the food, they eat the food, they go watch television or do something else and I have to clean up afterwards. So when I'm going to bed at night, it's after doing their laundry, taking care of the dogs, taking them out for a walk, bring them back. And she said, I'm exhausted. And I, and I said, what do you feel? She said, I feel unappreciated. I feel used. I feel like I'm an unpaid maid and a cook. And it's been this way my entire marriage and with my children. So I ask her another question. When your children and your husband are seeing you do the work that they could easily do or help you with, do they ever jump in and say, hold on a second, you've done enough. You know, you made the meal. Uh, it was a great meal. Let us do the cooking. You know, you take it easy now. She said, no. No, they got used to me doing everything. And then I got used to me doing everything. 
And then I felt it was just part of who I was to always be responsible for everyone and everything. So I said, so do you believe that it's possible? Mind you, this is just a hypothesis. Do you believe it's possible that you feeling unappreciated constantly could have contributed to stress hormones like cortisol that when they're elevated, cause oxidative stress at a very high level, and that oxidative stress could have been a, the progenitor or what precipitated the cancer cells instead of being engulfed uh, through phagocytosis and uh, the, the way the body cleanses itself of cancer cells that we're all producing all the time, by the way. And uh, uh, she said, I hadn't thought of that. I said to her at that time, I'd like for you to speak with someone. He's Dr. Lawrence Lachan brilliant mind. And he was associated with the Institute of Biology. And he was the reason that I was able to get initially, uh, let's take a look at apprenticeship to see if I fit in and contribute. These were ultra orthodox, very bright scientists, mainly doing research in cancer and pain, etc. And uh, I had no experience in any of that I was into health. <clears throat> Anyhow, he spoke with her. And he brought some studies that I didn't even know existed. And one of those studies that he had written showed that a group of women, I believe it was around 500 women, who had no breast cancer in their family and no risk factors, didn't smoke or drink or have excess sun exposure, all the things at that time people said would cause cancer. And yet a very high percentage developed cancer if, and here's the key, if they felt unappreciated if they felt that they were doing for others without anyone giving them the acknowledgement back, hey, that's terrific what you're doing. We really appreciate it. And so he made that association. He also made associations about people that get arthritis. Mainly women who get arthritis frequently also feel unappreciated doing things that others could do and are not. And therefore they have this responsibility somehow to do this, all right, for other people. In effect, they're always taking care of others. Once we found that there were two very good research projects, and this woman understood this, it was like a light went off in her head. And I said, why don't you bring your family together and let's have a conversation. And once the family heard of how much the mother suffered in silence and the stress that that created and the stress can cause Inflammation and inflammation can lead to cancer. Then suddenly everybody jumped in. Everybody became super appreciative, understood what they had done. They apologized profusely. And in the next 12 months, using only natural approaches, de-stressing, happiness, joy, doing things together, laughing, reversed her cancer. It's just one of those... <clears throat> In a long career, you have a lot of people in a lot of unusual cases, but the fact that someone made that shift means others could make it too. That's why I'm a big believer in what the doctor said on yesterday's program, that these randomized clinical studies are the only thing that we should look at and not look at what a doctor's experience is. No, <clears throat> we should pay a lot of attention to a doctor's experience because they're looking at the whole patient. And they're seeing them in this. So yeah, depression can come from a lot of causes. So let's deal with the underlying cause of depression, not just giving them Prozac and Paxil and Effexor and, and the other chemicals. Because if you want to know how badly that approach fails, why don't you look at the 22 approximately GIs, vets, who kill themselves each day, generally sticking a gun in their mouth, blowing the brains out. They have not had the talk therapy. They have not had lifestyle modification and changes. They have had lots of medications. And by the way, one of the side effects of those medications is suicidal ideation or suicide. By the way, for many of you who've been on my protocols for multiple sclerosis, you have seen them reverse. We've had people on the air, many people on this program, who talk about being able to live a normal life today. Their neurologists say you have no MS. Well, one of the things I do is I put everyone on an allergy-free diet. 
meaning no dairy products of any kind, no meat, no fried foods, no barbecued foods, no refined carbohydrates, no French fries, potato chips, pretzels, uh, toast, anything as browned as a carbohydrate, no. Increase acrylamides, which are chemicals that exacerbate inflammation in the body. No, lots of raw foods, lots of juices, especially spirulina and, and wheatgrass juice. Well, now the University of Bonn in Germany just came out with a new study saying that multiple sclerosis sufferers often complain of more severe disease symptoms after consuming dairy products. Researchers at the University of Bonn have now found a possible cause for this. According to the study, a protein in cow's milk can trigger inflammation that targets the insulating layer around the nerve cells, the myelin sheath. The study was able to demonstrate this link in mice, but also found an evidence of a similar mechanism in humans. So one of the reasons we don't recommend milk products is because of casein, and uh, that is a high quality allergen. By the way, when you see people drink milk and the next morning they're <coughs> clearing their throat all morning. When I did a study on allergies and I had them do the cocoa pulse test and then go on a five day elimination diet, about 90% of all that mucus clearing cleared up. This, journal, this uh, was published in the journal PNAS, peer reviewed journal. Well, what's the cocoa pulse test? It's simple. It was developed by Dr. Uh, Coca. He would ask you to take a single item of food and put it on your bedside or have your family member give it to you in the morning. But you get up and the first thing you do, you stay in bed, you take your pulse. You take your pulse for 60 seconds, write it down. Let's say it's 70 pulse beats per minute. Then you take that single item of food or beverage and you put it in your mouth. You don't even have to swallow it. And then you sit there for 20 minutes. Don't move around. And then you take your pulse again. If your pulse has gone up more than five beats, let's say it went to 75, and yet you've done nothing to cause it to go up, that's a metabolic reaction to an allergen. And so what you do, you eliminate that for five days. Then on the fifth day, you take a lot of that. And if you, any of the symptoms come back, aching in the joints, wheezing, um, nose, nose is running, anything like that, you know you're allergic to it and you eliminate it. So just one of the things that makes it easy for all of us to know what we're affected by. Oh, and by the way, from Illinois Institute of Technology, they found that anthocyanins in strawberries improve insulin resistance. This was published in Molecular Nutrition and Food Nutrition, and it found that the chemicals that are so important in all berries, but especially strawberries, can improve insulin sensitivity. And insulin resistance is a hallmark of metabolic syndrome and a risk factor for heart disease and type 2 diabetes. So we can now say that the people most likely to need this are people who are overweight, pre and actual diabetes conditions. So let's add one more. A cup of strawberries a day helps keep insulin resistance away, all right? So we got to get off that uh, all American diet, all right? And you don't need a lot of strawberries. They were only using 40 grams, equivalent to three cups of fresh strawberries, but it was in a powder form. So you could use strawberries, you could use a quart of strawberries, and that would be terrific for you. That's the latest on health and healing.